Welcome to the 2023 Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Speaker Series hosted by the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences, also known as CFAES, or some folks say CFAES. I say CFAES. Um, my name is Leo Taylor, and I work in the CFAES Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, for The Ohio State University. I've been there for actually five years this fall. Um, so this is one of the projects that I, I put together every year. Uh, and and speaking of of that, I realized it's July and I have to start thinking about next year. So if you if you uh, are aware of a speaker that you would recommend for our series, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you for being here today for this special event. I hope you'll join us for our speakers in September and November. So we host five speakers every year uh, and we um, spread it out over the course of the year. And I just want to highlight that uh, we have Dania uh, Francis, who will be speaking on the contemporary relevance of historic Black land loss in September on the 21st, same time. Uh, and then we have our keynote. Uh, I was able to get a very special speaker for our November slot, the quest for environmental and climate justice, why race and place still matter. This is Dr. Robert Bullard, who is considered or has been dubbed the um, father of environmental justice has been doing this work for many, many decades. Uh, we're very excited about this event. It's going to be uh, an afternoon of events, hybrid events that are uh, available to attend in person in Columbus or via Zoom, no matter where you are. We're gonna have the keynote address uh, and then an environmental justice panel that will be um, with the Environmental Professionals Network through the College of Food, Ag and Environmental Sciences. And then the Kerwin Institute, uh, will be joining us for a closing call to action at the end. So save the date. I don't have the registration information yet. I'm still waiting on some um, text from the speaker, but i um, very excited about this. So please feel free to block that on your calendar. Go ahead and stop sharing here. All right. I want to just cover a few logistics uh, before I introduce our speaker. So um, I can see video here uh, and chat is available for you to use throughout the session. Our speaker is going to most likely address questions towards the end, uh, but I'll be monitoring chat. If something pops up that's really urgent, I'll bring it to her attention. Uh, but this is gonna be an interactive session, so she'll be uh, engaging with you anyway. If you have questions, the Q&A feature, is that enabled? If it is not, then I will just keep an eye on chat. All right, we'll be good. A live transcription has been enabled for those who need it, and we're recording today's session. It will be available on our YouTube channel once we've had a chance to correct the transcript. If you have any issues or concerns, questions that you don't want to uh, air publicly, feel free to direct message me in the chat box. Uh, and uh, you can also be pseudo anonymous there if you want to post a question that way. All right, I think that's all I have for you. Uh, I want to uh, introduce our speaker now. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Gina Forster, who used to be with uh, OSU Dining Services, incidentally. Uh, and uh, here's a little bit of information about Gina. Gina graduated from Miami University with a degree in dietetics. Uh, followed by an internship at Mount Carmel College of Nursing. Soon after becoming a registered dietitian and starting to work her first RD job, uh, Gina decided to return to school for a master's degree in human nutrition, uh, human nutrition science from The Ohio State University. After receiving her master's, she worked for a brief period for a private workplace wellness company, followed by three years working as the dietitian and wellness coach at the Kingsdale Giant Eagle Market District. Uh, Gina spent the last 10 years as the Assistant Director of Nutrition for Ohio State's Dining Services, but recently left literally like within the past couple months um, to start her own practice as an intuitive eating coach. Uh, and she has a business called Nutrition Unmeasured, as you can see here. Uh, she's a certified intuitive eating counselor and an avid proponent of health at every size and works with uh, people of all ages to develop a healthier relationship with food and their body. Uh, she also noted that her favorite foods are Tommy's pizza, which I have never tried, and any cake with real buttercream, and I will, you know, place a vote on that as well. So uh, without further delay, I want to pass the mic to Gina. So thank you so much, Gina, for being here. I'm very excited about your uh, presentation. 
Thank you, Leo. Uh, I'm excited about all those presentations that you got us warmed up to prior to introducing me. And I've got some recommendations for you too. Um, and you got to try Tommy's Pizza if you haven't. And maybe there's some who are listening who disagree with me. And that's fine. I also like Grater's Ice Cream, Tommy's Pizza. Those go well together, in my opinion. Uh, one other thing I was going to say, oh, I actually just left OSU like, like two weeks ago. So I might know many of you on here. Uh, I, I was there for 10 years, obviously love OSU, which is why I'm, I'm here today bringing this presentation to you. Uh, so thank you for that introduction. A little bit more about me. I am a registered dietitian. I'm a certified intuitive eating counselor. Uh, I do own the business Nutrition Unmeasured. I also have a podcast. I actually had a podcast for three years, stopped it, and then brought it back uh, with more of an intuitive eating, health at every size lens, I would say. It was very, I wouldn't say diet heavy before, but it wasn't as intuitive eating focused, and now it it definitely is. So I just brought that back a couple months ago. I'm a mother of two, also a food lover, and I think it's important that I acknowledge my social privileges before doing this presentation as a thin, white, able-bodied woman. I know my lived experiences may be and likely are different than yours. And really, as I, as I stand before you and talk about body respect and body acceptance and intuitive eating, I just think it's important to always acknowledge that I don't have the lived experiences to understand how it feels really to be marginalized in any way. Uh, my biggest priority as a dietitian and coach in this space in particular is to continually listen and learn from those that I um, work with. Uh, I also prioritize continued education that ensures I have the tools and support uh, to, work, uh, to work with all types of people from all different backgrounds. Um, if after listening to this presentation, you would like recommendations from me for a more diverse dietitian, especially in this space, please reach out and I'm happy to give you that information. Objectives for today, uh, just, we're gonna describe thin privilege, review fat bias and health at every size. Uh, we're gonna really go into detail about intuitive eating, specifically four of the 10 principles. Identify pros, really small pros, because there's really none, but I had to put it in there, and cons of different diets. Interpret the hunger scale. Identify your internal signals for hunger and fullness. Maybe you're feeling them right now. Recognize the value of unconditional permission to eat all foods. Examine ways to improve your personal self-care. Determine alternatives to food for handling emotions. Identify resources for further learning. And lastly, if you would like, uh, I'm going to offer a short body acceptance meditation at the very end, so you don't need to stay for that. I will put that after all the questions, but it will be something that I will offer to those who are interested and have the time to stay for that. All right, let's talk about thin privilege. So this is a definition I got off the internet from Christy Harrison, who is a well-known dietitian in this space. She says, thin privilege is unearned. Thin privilege means that by virtue of some characteristic of your body, in this case, being below a certain size, you have greater access to resources and face less discrimination in society than people without that characteristic. So when I first entered the body positivity space, I will be honest, I was extremely confused. After 15 years of educating people on what I thought to be life-saving information, how to lose weight, I finally started to realize that our job is absolutely not to control our body shape and size, but actually to embrace and accept it. I started hearing the term thin privilege and I actually first heard it on a podcast and I really didn't fully understand it at all. My thoughts were thin privilege. Well, I'm not privileged because of my size. I have body image concerns too. Who says I have privilege? I was thinking, isn't this a body positivity space? Like, why are they telling me it's a privilege to be skinny? I was confused and I was naive. Again, I was very new in this space. So last year, when Savala, I, I wanna say that's how you pronounce her name, Savala Nolan, she spoke and I listened to her presentation. It was amazing. I believe that's still on YouTube. Uh, she did something similar to this exercise that I'm about to do to you today. Uh, but I thought it was important to do again. So I want you to 
you can turn off your cameras if you want to raise your hand or you can just acknowledge in your mind. Um, I'm gonna read some sentences and then if you have experienced this, you can either raise your hand if you have your camera off or just acknowledge that you have in, um, inside uh, mentally. Uh, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start. I want you to raise your hand or acknowledge if you've ever been presumed to be unhealthy or unwell because of your body size. Raise your hand if you've ever missed a diagnosis because your doctor was so concerned with your BMI, so concerned that they didn't even really talk to you about your other concerns. Guaranteed most clothing stores will not have your size. Been unsure you will find a comfortable spot to sit in public spaces. Avoid medically necessary treatment because of fear or shame. And last, been presumed to be lazy, uneducated, or lacking willpower because of your body size. So if you did not raise your hand or acknowledge uh, any of these, then you have thin privilege. And the purpose of this activity is not to shame anyone for having thin privilege or not but simply to make you more aware of the weight discrimination that exists in this country and beyond. So why is this? For years, our healthcare system has inaccurately depicted weight loss as a job that everyone should and can do. And if not, they're lazy and have zero willpower. We've all heard it. But our healthcare system is wrong and it's time for them to own up to it. The history of weight discrimination in our country has racial origins too. I'm not gonna get into that today, but I'm happy to recommend reading materials on that topic and also speakers, Leo, if you're interested on that very topic. And this activity specifically was brought to you by body image counselor, Bree Campos, if you're interested in uh, using this in anything that you do for your work or personal. So weight discrimination is on par with discrimination based on race and sex. And this is actually based on research that I put here in this slide. And I can send this off too, because I'm not sure if we're sending these slides or not, but this is uh, research based. So here's the question. Is it the fat or is it the stigma? Have you ever considered that the correlation between certain diseases and increased body fat has actually nothing to do with body fat but a lot to do with weight bias, stigma, and discrimination. So weight is a characteristic, not a disease. And there's no evidence linking fat directly with mortality. Did you know that the vast majority of studies that look at body weight and disease are correlation studies? And they don't actually show that body fat causes disease. So why is it that larger bodies are correlated with disease? Because we live in a society that's afraid of fat, it demonizes fat, it puts thinness on a pedestal, and that has convinced us that losing weight is something that we can control, and if we can't, as I've said, we're lazy, we haven't tried hard enough, we have no willpower, and we just don't care about our health. This kind of messaging can be detrimental to not only the human spirit, but also human health. The only people benefiting from this, this focus and obsession with weight loss are those who work in the diet and drug space, especially the drug space as of recently, which maybe you've heard about all the, the, the in the news, the new drugs that are out for weight loss. They're really profiting off of that right now. Cross-cultural cross studies have actually suggested that those in larger bodies are not subject to the same diseases in countries where there's less stigma. So countries where there's less stigma, the correlation doesn't exist between higher body fat and disease. So I might ask, do we even need to diet? What if we just accepted our bodies the way they were? What if we stopped the self-loathing and started ignoring the false tales of control we're told about through diet culture and diet companies? I found this on, I believe I stole it from a presentation. There's the citation if you're interested in that. But I just thought this was just so well put. How to make fat bodies unhealthy. This is a real good example of how we've created this problem called obesity, this obesity epidemic. It says one, pathologize certain bodies based on weight. 
Two, subject these bodies to bias, stigma, and oppression. Three, prescribe restrictive diets that don't adequately nourish them and often result in disordered eating. Four, set off a harmful course of weight cycling. And five, have medical professionals shame the owners of these bodies for their weight, blame every ailment on their weight, and fail to make a visit accessible or comfortable, reducing the likelihood that they'll seek out future medical care. Okay, it's time to stop. It's time to stop obsessing over body weight as a predictor of health. It's time to stop pretending like we have control over our weight and shape. It's time for the healthcare systems to get with the program and stop perpetuating the idea that our BMIs, body mass index, actually mean anything. And that brings me to health at every size. The health at every size principles and framework are a continuously evolving alternative to the weight-centered approach to treating clients and patients of all sizes. And this is a direct quote from the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health, ASDHA.org, if you're interested. So health at every size is a new way of looking at healthcare. For way too long, we've put the focus on our weight and the number on the scale, which has proven time and time again to be harmful and really just not helpful. Yes, there are people in the world living in larger bodies who may actually be unhealthy. But telling someone to lose weight, which again is a characteristic, our weight, instead of work on improving your health behaviors or your health habits, puts the focus on the weight instead of those health behaviors. So what happens then? And I've seen this. The person may make huge strides in their health by getting better sleep, eating more fruits and vegetables, engaging in more mindful movement. But yet the number on the scale doesn't budge. What if that was okay? Instead of giving up because of the failure to lose weight, what if that person continued on with their new changed behaviors and was healthier because of it? So back when I was a, for many years, a weight loss dietitian, I remember having a client who had diabetes and was trying to lose about 50 pounds. At the time, I just thought, oh, yes, I got this. I'm going to be good at this because, I mean, that's essentially what I went to school for because it's so focused on weight. We worked on her diet by increasing protein, reducing her sugar, and all the while, absolutely reducing her calories. This went on for months. Her weight would not budge. She was exercising, eating balanced, but we couldn't collectively figure out why she wasn't losing weight. Her blood sugars were great, which, yay. She was more active now, more mindful about her food choices. So the fact that she didn't lose weight, really, looking back, shouldn't have been a concern of mine. I kept thinking, I guess she needs to eat less. But that just wasn't realistic, as she was already eating less than she actually needed. Looking back, instead of thinking, well, shoot, what do we do now? The scale should have been put away while we focus on all the positive lifestyle changes and behaviors that she had worked on and made. If only I'd known them. She had already succeeded. Her weight wasn't going to budge because her body was happy where it was. Let's talk briefly about the social determinants of health. One third, which maybe to some of you seems like a lot, to others it might not seem like a lot, but one third of our health is based on individual behaviors. And what does that include? That includes self-care, nourishment, making sure that you're eating enough, nurturance, taking care of yourself, self-compassion, talking kindly to yourself, which I'll talk to you about in a moment here. The food that you eat, your activity level, getting enough sleep, not drinking alcohol in excess, not smoking. So that's one third of our health. And, that's, and, and notice food was only a tiny part of that one third, okay? But let's not forget about the other important parts of our health, social interactions, social environment, our genetics and our biology, which we really can't do much about, right? Our physical environment, access to medical care, and also access to medical care that you actually like and that makes you feel good. You know, a medical care professional that 
doesn't put you down and that respects you. So not just the access, but access to good medical care and then access to education and access to food. Diets are a remedy that do not work for a disease that does not exist. I have no idea who said this quote, but I love it. I took it from, I think, another presentation or a book that I read, and it was author unknown. I plugged it into Google. I can't figure out who said it, but I'm stealing it because it's, I just, I love it. Focusing on weight loss takes the focus away from so much more that predicts and determines how healthy we are. So in the book, Body Respect, which I'll mention at the end of this presentation, Lindo Bacon describes how the obesity epidemic only exists because we've defined it to exist. They say, by encouraging an accurate understanding of the root causes of health, the prevention of stigma, and the programming of self-care for people of all sizes, we can address real health concerns, giving both fat and thin people the support they deserve. And that brings me to intuitive eating. So engaging intuitive eating behaviors may or may not lead to weight loss. But as you can probably guess, that is not a measurement of success that I, as an intuitive eating coach, look for. So you may be thinking, but Gina, you just told me that weight discrimination is a real problem. So why wouldn't I want to focus on my weight? And that's a fair question, especially one to ask me, a person with thin privilege. As I work with people on intuitive eating, I also work with them on body acceptance and self-compassion. To me, they go hand in hand. It's not as easy as saying, you don't need to lose weight to be healthy. But over time, my goal is for people to realize their body is not the problem. When we're truly in tune with our body, our body will do what it wants and land on a weight and shape that it was meant to have. This may or may not be the weight and shape you started with on your journey, and it may not be a weight or shape that you want. Accepting this is not easy, and I don't want to make it out to be easy. And for many people, there are stages of grief that come with the acceptance, but the reward at the end, living a life without that focus on controlling your weight and size, I believe it's almost always worth it, if not always. So when you do the work to say no to diet culture and no to size oppression, you'll come up on top. When you start to understand the importance of surrounding yourself with positive people, people who care about you, people and healthcare providers who treat, treat you with respect and don't look at you through a biased lens, you'll start to see the truth that you're amazing, unique, and are so much more than your body. So let's talk about intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is a self-care eating framework which integrates instinct, emotion, feelings, and rational thought when making food choices. So there's 10 principles of intuitive eating, and the ones in bold are what we're going to be focusing on today. Reject diet mentality, honor your hunger, make peace with food, challenge the food police, feel your fullness, discover the satisfaction factor, cope with your emotions with kindness, respect your body, move, feel the difference, and then honor your health with gentle nutrition. What intuitive eating is not is a diet plan or even a, just a diet. It's definitely not a diet. Some people will say to me, oh yeah, intuitive eating is that hunger fullness diet, right? We very much focus on hunger and fullness with intuitive eating coaching, absolutely, but we also give permission to really eat even when you're not hungry and not always stop when you're full because permission is the key to intuitive eating. Permission in, with food and really all aspects of life. The cornerstone of intuitive eating is self-care. And this is my son. Um, he is actually six at this, at this uh, moment. But in this photo, I'm not even kidding, he was three months old and that's his hair. And I just love this photo because he just looks so peaceful because the first part of a good self-care practice is sleep. And we can't all sleep like a baby. We can dream to sleep like a baby, right? But sleep is probably, I always tell anyone I work with, if there's a pyramid, a hierarchy of needs as far as our health and our self-care, I would put sleep at the very bottom as in the biggest part if we're not getting good and adequate numbers of sleep and, and adequate um, quantity or quality of sleep, 
it's just everything else sort of falls apart. It's a ripple effect. So sleep, finding a balance in your life, work-life balance in particular, nourishment, making sure that you are feeding yourself enough. I will tell you the vast majority of people that I work with, the first thing I do is look to see what they're eating, not to make changes to it, but to add more. Self-compassion. Another thing that I at nauseum bring up with my clients is how are you talking to yourself these days? What's what, how are you being kind to yourself? Are you treating yourself the way you treat your own kids, your best friend, your colleagues? Are you talking to them differently than you talk to yourself? And what does that look like? One of my favorite quotes kind of, but it's from the intuitive eating book and it's come, come at your decisions with curiosity or your actions with curiosity, not judgment. Um, and I realize I spelled judgment wrong here. It's a, it's a, I, I make that mistake constantly. There's no E. Uh, so what that means is let's just say you find yourself in the kitchen late at night, eating a, a pint of Ben and Jerry's. So be curious about what brought you to the kitchen to eat that pint of, of Ben and Jerry's. What unmet need are you trying to meet through that Ben and Jerry's ice cream? That is so much more kind and gentle and will get you so much further than putting yourself down and feeling guilty about making that decision. So self-compassion. And then lastly, self-nurturance, doing things, not just talking to yourself kindly, but doing things that are, that make you feel good. It could be, you know, paying some money to get a massage or it can be free. Going for a walk in nature is self-nurturance. Taking a long bath. Let's start with principle one, which is reject diet mentality. Many people fear that if they stop dieting, they'll never stop eating. But the truth is that it's always the dieting that causes the overeating, or I should say almost always the dieting that causes the overeating. I also have the link to this research if you're interested uh, in my notes here, which if we're sending out this at the end, I can provide that information uh, to Leo. All right, I don't know, one day I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna type in diets on Google and I put together a, a word cloud for diets. This is probably one millionth of how big it could have been, but these are some of the top diets that I found. Uh, keto, low carb, ultra cleanse, Jenny Craig, still around, Whole30, intermittent fasting isn't even on here, but that's a diet. Noom, they say they're not a diet, but they are when there's green and red foods to eat. That's a diet, which we'll talk about here in a second. The success rate of diets. So one third to two thirds of weight is regained within one year of a diet. And this is based on one pretty large research study. And then generally almost all is gained back within five years. And I'm not talking about necessarily just diets such as Weight Watchers or Noom or intermittent fasting. I'm really talking about anything that causes you to restrict the intake of food. So I would even argue that just counting calories, counting points, that is a diet. So even if you haven't gone online and signed up for a specific diet, if you're counting calories, that is a way of restricting your intake. So that's the general consensus that generally about one third to two thirds is regained within one year, almost all within five years. And there's a lot of research too that supports that when we restrict our intake and go on diets, it actually causes us to gain more weight than when we started. The biggest predictor of weight gain is weight loss. So studies show that diets and weight loss are actually predictors, predictors of future weight gain, not long-term loss. And again, restriction of any type just doesn't work because our biology, our bodies, they do anything possible to compensate. To our bodies, restriction of any type is almost like a famine. Your body doesn't recognize that you're on a diet. To your body, it, it is, it's, it's not right. Something is wrong. I need to do anything I possibly can to protect you. So that's what your body's saying. What can I do to protect myself right now at this time of famine? Or, you know, the person who's carrying me around isn't eating enough. I need to do whatever I can to make this better. So I'm going to retain weight. I'm going to send out hormones to make them hungrier. And this is what happens. The bottom line is failing to lose weight long-term 
is a actual sign of success that your internal weight regulation system is working. Diet failure is no more a sign of gluttony or lack of character or willpower than breathing deeply after exertion indicates lung failure or shivering in cold weather indicates weakness. So in other words, quote unquote, failing a diet is, is actually a good thing because that means your body is doing exactly what it was supposed to do to protect you. Diets have some things in common and here's where I want to really get some engagement here. Uh, I just want you to type your ideas in the chat, some things that diets have in common, all diets have in common. Restriction, yes, great. Restrictive eating, portion control, fasting. These days, I feel like that's very common. Yes, the fasting diet. They cost something often, absolutely. Counting of whatever it is, whether it's macros, points, calories, guilt, that was a good one. All, yes, guilt and shame, absolutely. It's like diet companies use your guilt and shame to keep you coming back and it generally works. Fear, moralizing food, good versus bad, absolutely. Yes, and that is something I hear my clients say a lot and I'll, I'll kind of call them out on it a little bit when I hear them say, I ate something good or I ate something bad. And of course, a non-judgmental way, but we're trying to neutralize foods. Removal of food groups. Yeah, there's very few diets that don't take away some type, some food group. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's was the big pull with intermittent fasting. They're like, oh, you can eat whatever you want. Yeah, that's great. There's no omission of food groups that I'm aware of. But when you're omitting a certain time to eat, you know, that's restriction. Hunger while you're dieting. So yeah, the word hunger, that's a great one. I think that's a, a common trait of many diets since you're restricting and usually not getting uh, the actual nourishment that your body needs. Good. And a focus on the number on the scale or your BMI. Nice work. I've got restriction rules, omission of food guilt, of food groups, guilt and shame, but you guys went, went all out. Good job. All right, dieting is the number one predictor of weight gain and has been linked to the development of eating disorders. And here's how a typical diet cycle will look. You might personal, personally have uh, actually experienced this, but if not, at least you know someone who has, whether it's a colleague, a friend, a family member. Someone has this desire to not even just be thin, but to change their body in some way, whether it's lose 20 pounds, lose 100 pounds, whatever it is. And then they choose a diet, you know, put their hand in the grab bag of diets and then pick one. And they probably feel great those first couple of weeks. Heck, they might even feel great for a couple months, maybe even six months. Who knows? I've heard it all. But eventually, because no diet lasts forever, there's cravings because your body, your body's inner um, biology and, and th those meters are going off saying, what's something's going, going on here? Like something is wrong. So it starts sending out those craving signals and I need to eat. What are we going to do? Start to have cravings. And then eventually you give into those cravings and then you have periods of uncontrolled eating. And then eventually you regain any weight that you lost oftentimes plus more that rebound weight gain. Maybe you chill out for a while, take a little break from dieting. And then maybe a year later, or even six months later, later, whatever it is, you come back to that desire again. And you realize I, I'm going to do better this time. This time is going to be different. And then it all starts over again. So I've mentioned this a couple of times, how dieting contributes actually to overeating. You know, the, that quote I put at the beginning of the presentation, how uh, it's actually dieting that makes us have cravings or causes us to overeat. But many people are afraid if they stop dieting, they'll eat whatever they want. But the irony is it's the dieting that's making that happen. So how do you think dieting contributes to overeating? You guys can put, yeah, you can put these in the chat if you'd like. The shame involved in dieting, yeah, it's a vicious cycle. You just what like what I said, you you finally break the rule of your diet and then you have shame about it. And then the floodgates are open and then you just eat. 
giving up hope of losing weight. Yep. You've got cravings. Yes, because cravings ultimately happen with every single diet. When the success isn't quick enough, you feel guilty and that causes overeating. Re this is a good one. Yeah, it reduces your metabolism. Yeah, absolutely. You might overexercise and then that might then lead to eating more. Absolutely. Obsession over what you're allowed to eat. And then, it, and then you just get so overwhelmed. Like, well, what even am I supposed to eat? Oh, I'm just going to eat whatever. And then my diet starts again tomorrow. Stress. Absolutely. Okay. Those were some good ones. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and move on here. Uh, what did I put on here? Things like calorie counting actually work against you because your biology works hard to take over and overcompensate for your restriction. Um, your body is constantly working to keep you at that happy, happy set point weight. So if you're restriction, your biology, or if you're restricting, your biology will always catch up and you'll have that primal urge to eat at some point. Uh, and then dieting increases those hunger hormones as well. All right, let's move on to principle two, honor your hunger. A big part of intuitive eating is interoceptive awareness or the ability to really feel and listen to what your body is telling you and how your body feels. Researchers use participants' ability to perceive their heart rate without touching their body as a way to measure interoceptive awareness or what I like to say, body attunement. So this is something that you can do anytime, any place. I was gonna do this activity now, but actually I think we're gonna continue on. So again, if you're trying to measure how well you do at really feeling the different signs and signals that your body is giving you, whether it's having to go to the bathroom or the feeling of hunger or the feeling of fullness, uh, you can practice this in your office sometime, just at, at, your, at your computer, just sit still, almost like you're getting ready to meditate, close your eyes. And don't touch your heart, don't touch your pulse, maybe keep your hands on your, on your thighs or wherever you'd like that feels comfortable. And then just try to see if you can feel your heart uh, and your heart rate, whether it's a pulse in your wrist or your actual heart um, on the left of your chest. And then compare that number to what your actual average resting heart rate is. And with continual practice, this will help you be a better at better at that interoceptive awareness or that whole body attunement, which is so important where you, when you can start to figure out what hunger feels like, what fullness feels like, because it's kind of different for everyone. Uh, and once you're really good at detecting your heart rate, you can start to detect those nuanced signals of hunger and fullness. Let's talk about hunger, the hunger scale. So the hunger scale goes from zero to 10. Uh, zero being, being, you know, you're painfully hungry. I'm assuming you haven't eaten all day, maybe even for a couple of days. I mean, you are on, you're running on complete emptiness. Whereas the opposite end of the spectrum is 10, where you are painfully full and stuffed. I, I like to say this is, I feel like this maybe on Thanksgiving day after my second helping and dessert, like I am at a 10. I am, I can't put any more food into my body. That's a 10. So ideally you want to eat when you're at that comfort, comfortably hungry uh, place on this, on this hunger scale, that between that three and four, you're hungry, you're ready to eat, but it's really not urgent. And then ideally you want to stop eating when you're at that comfortable fullness, that six to seven. You're beginning to sense fullness emerging, it's comfortable, you feel satisfied and content. And I say ideally, again, not as a rule, this is just a guideline. Even the best intuitive eaters are gonna eat past comfort, comfortable fullness at times and eat when they're ravenous at times because that's just life and that's what happens. But generally speaking, this could be a good, a good goal for you. Also food tastes better when you're at that three or four on the hunger scale. So just let me ask another question. What signs does your body give you that you're hungry? And you guys can just put these in the, in the chat. Headache, yeah, growling, yep, stomach growling. I think that's, the, that's probably the number one answer that I get. Shakes, yeah, 
definitely. For me, when I get the shakes, like I am, I'm at that like two or one on that hunger scale. I've waited way too long. Could be different for others. Hangry. Oh yeah. Who hasn't been hangry before? Anger and hunger because you're just so ravenous. Lightheaded, bad mood. Yeah. So there can be mental or mind signals that your body gives you that you're, it's time to eat. You're in a bad mood. Your, your colleagues are like, all right, you, you got to go eat something or your kids. That was, I'm, I'm glad someone said this, thinking about food, because that was the last one I was waiting for. That was another, another sign that you might be hungry. If you're not noticing any physical signs yet, maybe you can start by paying attention to when you start to think about food. If you're at your desk and you're like, hmm, what am I going to have for lunch today? Ooh, that, that chili and baked potato sounds really good. That could be like one of your first signs that it's almost time to eat and I'm going to start to get hungry here pretty soon. Good job. All right, we'll move on. Let's talk about primal or rebound hunger. It's when biological hunger is ignored. Primal hunger takes over. So our biological hunger is just what I was talking about. All those signs and signals that your body needs food. Uh, but if you ignore it, if you're like pushing it away because of diet culture or whatever it is, or maybe you're just too busy to eat, inevitably you will have this primal rebound hunger, which I like to explain as it's the same as when you're underwater for a really long time and then you come up for air and you gasp for air. That's how you feel when you finally get around food, when you have biological hunger. You cannot get food in your body fast enough. I'm actually gonna skip this question because it's just in the interest of time. I had this planned out perfectly, but clearly I'm talking maybe a little bit too much. So what are some things you can do to prevent primal hunger? I'll just give you a couple ideas. Eating, nourishing your body every four to five hours. I would say that most people have this primal hunger at the end of the day. Based on you know, what I hear in you know, sessions with clients, they go most of the day without eating. And then they had that primal hunger at the end of the night. So eating periodically throughout the day, nourishing your body. Another instance might be the weekends. I do really well during the week, but then on the weekends, I go, I go wild. Uh, you know, maybe putting more food during your Monday through Friday, Friday routine will prevent that primal urge to eat on the weekends. Practical hunger. So I said at the beginning that intuitive eating is not the hunger fullness diet. So if you are ever not hungry, but you think maybe it should be, it's, it's a time to eat, give yourself permission. For example, I used to work for dining services. I would go in, especially in the fall, because I was always working in the operations during the fall, which was so much fun. And I, I worked at the union once this, uh, this past fall, and I went in for a shift to work for, at, at the Grubhub area, and it was four to nine. I knew I'd be there till nine. And I was like, that's a long time. And I'm not sure I'll have a break to eat just because it's just so, so busy. I'd probably get a break for a small snack. That wouldn't be enough for me. I'm not really hungry, but I know that if I don't eat something now, I'm going to get hangry by nine. So I made myself uh, a bowl of soup and a, I don't even know, I think I got a roll and a bowl of soup. That's practical hunger. When you're not really hungry, but practically speaking, it makes sense to eat. Maybe before you're going into a big meeting, for example, and you know there's not going to be any food, go ahead and eat something before you go in there. Taste hunger. There also might be times when, you know what, something just sounds good and looks good. Give yourself permission to eat it. Let's go on to principle three. Oh, I didn't read principle three. Making peace with food. In a random survey of 2,075 adults, 45% said they feel guilty after eating foods they like. Let's talk about unconditional permission to eat food. So chronic dieters live in their heads and second guess the needs of their body. And what I, what I mean by that is they're either thinking about calories or points or what time it is on the clock, right? Rather than asking their body, am I hungry? What sounds good right now? Food restriction is actually what contributes to overconsumption. So giving yourself unconditional permission to eat, that's the answer. And it's because of something called habituation. Habituation explains what happens when you are repeatedly exposed to the same stimulus. It could be a sign on your drive home, a smell in your house, or a food. The novelty of it begins to wear off. So essentially, if you give yourself unconditional permission to eat food, for example, cupcakes, let's just say, maybe that's one of your fear foods that you never allow. If you give yourself 
unconditional permission to eat cupcakes, they're not going to be as enticing. And when you eat them and the reward centers in your brains aren't going to go on fire when you do eat them, it's just going to turn into any other food. The more a person is exposed to a certain food, the less appealing it becomes. Leftovers are a great example. You have lasagna one night, it's great. The second night, it's okay. The third night in a row, it's like you don't wanna look at a lasagna ever again. So that's habituation. So here's what people think will happen when they give themselves unconditional permission to eat all foods. They think, well, I'm gonna eat, like on the left here, you know, I'm going to eat McDonald's, French fries and burgers and, and cupcakes and ice cream all day long. And the truth is, if you've been restricting those foods for a long time, you might do that for a while. But again, trusting the process is key. Giving yourself that unconditional permission, not pseudo permission, not just on the weekends or not just on certain days of the week or not just for one month, unconditional. Eventually what will happen with time and trust is those foods will still be consumed, but other foods will fall in place as well. And you'll find yourself eating balanced without being told to do so. Let's talk about principle seven, cope with emotions with kindness. I love this quote from the intuitive eating book edition three. It says, what we eat is less important than why we eat. So when we were little, we ate for one purpose and that was to alleviate physical hunger. And then as we grew, we started using food for other reasons, to handle sadness, to celebrate wins, to mourn losses, to handle times of boredom or restlessness, to heal pain. The journey of intuitive eating takes a close look at the reasons we eat with the ultimate goal of choosing food for, generally speaking, one reason and that is hunger. I say generally speaking, because like I said, sometimes you're gonna choose food just because it sounds good and there's nothing wrong with that. This does not mean eating to celebrate or to handle boredom at times also doesn't happen or that it's bad and it will. Uh, but for the most part, choosing food because of biological hunger or practical hunger is gonna be our ultimate goal. Again, I'm gonna skip this just in the interest of time here, but just you can maybe think in your head, what are some emotions that evoke a desire within you to eat? Uh, I know probably some of the comp things that you're thinking of might be stress, fear, sadness, loneliness, boredom. I think boredom is actually the number one um, feeling actually that people have that causes them to go to food to find something to handle their boredom. Or even procrastination is another one. I don't wanna work on this paper, oh, I'll go eat something. So how do we deal with that? First ask yourself, are you taking care of you? So is your emotional eating related to a lack of self-care? When you're lacking self-care, think about those things I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. It's really hard to be attuned to your body's needs and desires or your body's hunger and fullness cues. So perhaps if you find yourself constantly emotionally eating, you're just not in tune with your body yet. And working on that is gonna be important, but that starts with a good self-care routine. Self-care, nurturance, self-compassion, they're all integral to help deal with emotional ups and downs as well. So not only are they important to help you have that uh, interoceptive awareness and attunement of your body's uh, signals, but also self-care is important to help you with emotional ups and downs. So again, sleep, life balance, comfort, warmth, relationships, creative stimulation, and then Self-compassion, coming from a place of curiosity and not judgment. So when you find yourself mindlessly eating, here's something that you can do. And this is from my Instagram. You can ask, you can use the acronym HALT, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Am I actually hungry? So check, check in with your body, see how you feel. Maybe you are, maybe you realize I'm really not. I just had a really large lunch. I'm not hungry. But what am I experiencing right now? Am I angry, lonely, tired, keep filling in the blanks? In other words, you're, you're taking the time to stop and think and be mindful of 
why you're eating. And it might not be actual hunger. It may be an emotion or a feeling. Here's the thing. If you decide it's an emotion or a feeling and you still choose to eat food, give yourself permission to do that. So again, asking yourself, what do I feel now? If you find yourself dealing with an emotion and wandering towards food, just stop and ask yourself, what am I feeling? What do I need? Again, maybe it's food that you need, in which case eat it. But just taking that moment to stop and you know, put that break in between you and the food will be a good habit to get into. If you find that you're constantly choosing food, that might be a sign that maybe getting some therapy or talking to someone about that is a good idea. But maybe you'll choose to do something else, like read a book or go for a walk or listen to some music or take a bath or talk to a friend. Uh, finding other ways to handle feelings and emotions, especially when they're strong feelings and emotions, and especially when they're happy, happening a lot. So when we're distracted by the hustle, we lose access to language that describes our emotional world and we adopt the language of food and fat. Our body becomes the scapegoat. Instead of recognizing our anger, we direct that anger towards our body. And I have to say, I relate to this at times. I know people I work with can relate to this quote. We use our body as a scapegoat when we're handling certain emotions and feelings. So the key is to get comfortable really sitting with those emotions and feelings. They like to say, sitting in the suck, if you've ever heard of that. I like that. Just sitting in the really uncomfortable feeling that, oh, no one likes to sit with. And this quote is from, one of my favorite books, which I'll mention at the end here, Reclaiming Body Trust um, by Hilary Canavi and Dana Sturdivant. They, the book is just absolutely amazing. So when we experience emotions, our body becomes the scapegoat. It may look like talking down to our body, eating past comfort, or just having a really poor body image day where we can't seem to feel good in our skin at all. And again, learning to sit with our emotions can be extremely difficult. After years of using our bodies as a scapegoat, especially, turning off our negative energy um, towards our bodies can be really difficult and uncomfortable, but it's so important on this journey. So I wanna just mention the last principle, which is uh, gentle nutrition, honoring that gentle nutrition. And I'm not gonna, gonna talk about it today, but if you're interested about that, it's on my podcast episode uh, from September of 2021, episode 105. They're actually not numbered. So don't look for 105. There's no numbers anymore, but it's from September 2021. I actually interviewed one of the co authors of Intuitive Eating, Elise Resch, one of my favorite interviews. And so if you're interested in what they say about gentle nutrition, it's a really good, good episode to listen to. Just a reminder intuitive eating is a journey, not a destination. It, there's really no end goal or weight to reach or shape to achieve with intuitive eating, uh, but there will be a day after some time that you realize, oh my gosh, I don't think about food as much anymore. How liberating. Uh, I have more space in my brain, more time in my day to do things I actually love. I'm trusting my body. And when that moment comes, it feels amazing. Two books that I would highly recommend, The Intuitive Eating Workbook, as well as The Intuitive Eating Book, which is the fourth edition. There's actually, yeah, there's four editions. The first one was written in 1995. My mom had it, I remember very well, and I actually read it when I was probably in fourth grade. I would just pick up random books and read them, but I read that one. It's, it's pretty thick, but really, really tiny, tiny little letters, but it's been updated quite a bit since, so I recommend getting the fourth edition. Some other fantastic books that I would highly recommend, uh, Health at Every Size by Lindo Bacon, as well as Body Respect by Lindo Bacon. They went by Linda at the time of writing both of those. So just FYI, if you're looking it up, uh, they went by Linda, now they go by Lindo. And then Decolonizing Wellness, I just finished that book, Amazing by Dahlia Kinsey. That's one I would recommend that she come and talk as part of this series. And then You Just Need to Lose Weight and 19 Other Myths About Fat People amazing. 
these are all amazing. Ah. And then reclaiming body trust, a path to healing and liberation. And then lastly, the body kindness workbook by Rebecca Scritchfield. Okay. Almost at the end. So through divesting from diet culture and exploring intuitive eating, I really believe it's possible to get back to experiencing body trust, diet liberation, peace, permission, and so much more. This takes time, support, and most likely a lot of grieving. After all, what we've been taught our whole lives about our ability to control our weight and the way we look is wrong. So this beautiful picture is from the Body Trust, uh, Center for Body Trust uh, website and book that I had up there. The tree tells the story of the path to body trust, which starts at the top with educating yourself on the facts of health and our bodies and exploring your body story. And it ends with deepening your roots with kindness and curiosity and finding a community that supports you. If you're interested in working with me, there's my website. You can also follow me on Instagram at Nutrition Unmeasured. I'm also offering a 10, uh, 10 module self-paced course, which is half off if ordered early. I didn't put the link in here, but it will be ready in September, but I'm offering it now for half off if you're interested in that. Also, I have an Etsy store. If you're interested uh, or if you're ready to start openly declaring your distaste for diets and your body respect, visit my Nutrition Unmeasured Etsy page for decals, mugs, and much more. And now I would love to open it up for questions. This is fantastic. <clears throat> fantastic, Gina. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a couple of things uh, in chat, but I want to just point out that I did just post a link to a uh, feedback survey. We would really love to get your feedback. Um, and also any recommendations you might have for speakers for the series. But uh, there were two uh, two folks, or actually one person who asked for some resources that I'll follow up with you about, empirical studies on uh, the uh, correlative versus causative relationship between obesity and disease. Uh, folks are interest, always interested in that. And uh, then the other one was about <clears throat> building muscle mass. So I'll follow up with you separately on that. Uh, but it looks like Elaine might have a comment or a question? Yeah, uh, Elaine says, I'm thin and have had people <clears throat> make comments and judgments about me all the time, as in gain weight, yeah. I am a, I'm at a healthy, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. I am at a healthy weight. I also can hardly ever find my size in stores. Sizes are always larger anymore. I wear a four or six depending. I have to order online and even then can be challenging. So I'm not feeling very privileged. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it. it's, it's definitely different. Um, uh, when you are living a smaller body, uh, it's, if I hope that no one takes offense to the term thin privilege, I, there are certainly things be, having a smaller body that can be hard too, but generally speaking, just so much different than, uh, the experience that those in larger bodies have, but I'm, I'm, I empathize with you, Elaine. So thank you for sharing that. If not wanting to classify food as good or bad, do you have advice on how to teach helpful eating to children? Oh, I love that question. Honestly, because I have two kids of my own, I don't call foods anything. I just call them food. I don't, I don't even really, I don't really say much. I know I will say as my kids have gotten older, especially my daughter Paige, I might say something like, uh, if she notices that she's really hungry, for example, I might say, oh, you know what, something with some fat and protein might really help. And then we'll start talking about, you know, what has fat and what has protein, or maybe she'll, my kid, my son, sometimes if he has GI problems, for example, I might say, hmm, you know, have you been getting a lot of fiber lately? Let's talk about what has fiber in it. And so that's, I, I, I kind of start, I, I focus more on the macronutrients versus calling out foods as, well, this is better for you and this isn't good for you. Uh, I try to keep it at a higher level, I think. Uh, and I make sure that when I talk about protein, fat, and fiber, that really any food can be a part of that. So for example, if my daughter was like, oh, fat, maybe I'll have some French fries. Oh, French fries, that sounds great. You know what? 
French fries are made with potatoes. Potatoes have fiber. Let's get some French fries. What else can we pair with that? So just really high level, I hope that helps. I think that might've been it. What about drinks? Oh, hold on, there was, OSU requires BMI for the insurance, insurance discount annually. I don't actually know if that is 100% true. I feel like if you go to um, a biometric screening, you can refuse to be weighed and just tell them what you think you weigh, FYI, I've done that before. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, and you can do that at your doctor's office too, by the way. You do not need to get weighed at your doctor's office. You can absolutely tell them that you don't wanna be weighed and then tell them what you think that you weigh unless you're getting prescribed a medication that requires or you're, you know, you're getting anesthesia. Obviously that's a different story, but generally speaking, you do not need to get on that scale. What about drinks that are habit, coffee or soda? Soda is my downfall and it's hard to think there would ever be a time when I wouldn't pick soda over water. Yeah, that can be a tricky situation. Uh, definitely think that coffee and soda, even if it's a habit, can be a, a part of an, an intuitive eating journey. I've worked with people on that who have found that their soda habit was more of an emotional tendency and habit, like you said. Uh, but that definitely exists and is something that I've worked with people on. So it's not, it, I would say it's something that with work, you could, you could work on for sure. Can intuitive eating help with heart health? Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. I actually have a whole presentation on intuitive eating for people uh, with high cholesterol or high blood pressure. I've often heard when you're hungry, you might actually be thirsty. Ugh, what a diet thing to say too. I've heard this too. And to drink water rather than eat. Mm -hmm. So then I feel guilty. Exactly. I've heard this too. In fact, I used to tell people this like, oh, if you think you're hungry, just go grab and chug a big thing of water. That is diet mentality, 100%. Here's the thing. If you, if you think maybe you're thirsty, there's a difference between feeling thirst more in your mouth and hunger, which is more of a physical feeling. So working through what hunger actually feels like will help, help you decipher the two. But also a question you can ask yourself is, when was the last time I ate something? If it's been more than three or four hours and you think you might be hungry, you probably are. Um, but also if you, have, if you haven't been drinking water all day or maybe you've only had coffee, then you're probably also thirsty. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad that you said that. I've definitely heard that. And it's very much a, a diet mentality thing. And I'm sorry that you feel guilty about that. But yeah, just getting more in tune with what hunger feels like and reminding yourself, eat every, I would say, you know, three to five hours. Uh, so the presentation on heart health, maybe I'll bring it to OSU. I, 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 it's not live or it's not published anywhere, uh, but perhaps I will mention being able to bring that somewhere somehow to OSU and present. Did I get treated? Yeah. I have high BMI. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I see the, the biometric um, uh, comment and uh, about BMI. I've actually, well, I won't get into it, but I, I just want to reiterate that you do not need to get uh, weighed at your BMI at your next at your next biometric screening visit. So there you go. Okay. I got pushed back when I refuse and wait. I'm like, yeah, they're going to push back. I, they push back back with me too. If you, if you tell you, if you tell your doctor, you don't want to get weighed. If you tell your nurses, you don't want to get weighed. If you tell me what the biometric screening, you don't want to get weighed. They will probably look at you a little bit differently because they're not used to hearing it. But if we can all come together collectively and do this, maybe they'll start to get used to it and they won't give us these stares like what? Um, but I just don't think that they're used to it, that most people just go ahead. It's the first thing they do, right? Get on the scale. So everyone's just like, okay, I guess I'll get on the scale. Uh, I get those kind of stares too, but I don't think it's for any other reason other than they're just not used to it. How are we doing on? Oh, we've got plenty of time. Okay. I continue to eat more dinner than I need because my kids are still eating very slowly. Yes. Then I'll get up and start cleaning up the kitchen, but feel bad about leaving them at the table, but then I'll eat more. Any tips are welcome. Yeah, and that's kind of a big question, I would say. Uh, the first thing I might suggest is maybe start, if you know that your kids are slow eaters, which I feel like kids are kind of known for that, 
and you, and you find the tendency to continue picking when they're still eating is maybe set a timer. I've done, I do that with my kids. Like I'll, and not to say that when the timer goes off, they have to stop eating, but Hey, we're going to have family together time at, for, for 15 minutes or however long, once the timer goes off, feel free to continue eating, but mommy and daddy or mom or dad, whoever it is, are going to get up and start doing other things. So they know, okay, we're going to eat as a family or, um, you know, whoever it is for this long amount of time. And then afterwards, this, after this uh, alarm goes off, I can still eat, but you know, mom is going to, is going to leave and start doing dishes. I don't know if that helps, but that works in our house uh, with slow eaters. Like I'm going to set this timer. I'm going to leave after that. You guys can continue eating. BMI doesn't consider your muscle. Yeah. Yeah. BMI is just a load of, it's just that. And I can give you some research behind that. So someone mentioned about how it doesn't consider your muscle. It's actually based on white males, uh, which is, you know, obviously doesn't really, it doesn't consider the vast majority of our population. So yeah. And it doesn't consider muscle mass either. Yes. How do you balance the desire to follow intuitive eating with the desire to also lose weight? It's hard. And again, I have thin privilege, so I actually don't really know how hard it is. I just know it because of what I see. Um, I will say I have a history of a pretty severe eating disorder. Uh, so I do, even though I have thin privilege, have a history of really loathing my body and really feeling in control when I was controlling my food intake. Like I never felt so great uh, than when I was in that eating disorder mindset, but that was all mental. Looking back, I actually felt horrible. Uh, so it was really hard to adapt to an intuitive eating lifestyle when that eating disorder kept trying to pull me back or when weight loss is trying to keep pull you back, but it really just takes practice, lots of time. And like I said, a lot of grieving. Looks like that might be it. Okay, how do you determine if you're an emotional eater? That's a really good question. And there's a lot of ways I could explain this. I think I actually didn't put the continuum of emotional eating up on the slide, but there is a, a continuum or a spectrum, I should call it, that goes really from eating just for pleasure to eating as punishment. And when you find that you're eating really without physical hunger and it's punitive, or if um, you're doing it often where you are not eating because you're hungry, you're just eating to placate or, you know, to, or at the other extreme to punish. I think it depends on how often it's happening, I would say. And how good you are at really truly being able to feel hunger and what that feels like and to honor that. Journaling would be really helpful, I think, in this instance, if you're wondering if you're an emotional eater. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big question and I'm happy to answer that maybe off the, off the call as well. Portion sizes, yes, I absolutely think portion sizes are restrictive. I always recommend to my clients not looking at labels at all. Obviously, it might be different if you have diabetes, but even with type 2 diabetes, I highly recommend not looking at, at food labels. Maybe someone who has to restrict their sugar or their um, salt, that might be a little bit different too, but I generally think portion sizes are just another way to restrict real label, you say, oh, so the portion size is 12 almonds. So you stick with 12 almonds, but then you're still hungry, but then you feel guilty because 13 almonds is more than the portion size that was recommended. So I highly recommend um, avoiding labels. Uh, okay, I struggle. I know we have four more minutes. Hopefully it's okay that I'm gonna keep going here. So I struggle with wanting to lose weight while also avoiding dieting too. Yeah, you're on the fence. It's a very, and sometimes people stay there for a really long time and that's okay, but you're on the fence. So we wanna kind of teeter you off into the other, into the other zone and found that focusing on self-love and acceptance at any weight was the best way to navigate it. It's definitely not easy, but learning to love your body as it is is such a beautiful thing. Yes, I love that.
not reading labels does not seem correct ingredient wise. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think I, I actually don't ever look at ingredients either personally. I think that that is another diet mentality thing, unless you actually have ingredients that you need to avoid such as food allergies, for example, or intolerances to certain things. That is a completely different story. That's what I did for the last 10 years at OSU. Uh, but I actually don't even think, I don't see the point in looking at ingredients either personally. That's just my personal take. I think that that can also make you second guess what you actually desire. For example, a big part of intuitive eating is asking what sounds good? What do I want now? And if something sounds good and that's what you want and you go pick it up and you read the ingredient label or the, um, yeah, the ingredient label and you think, oh, this is too many ingredients. This is bad. And you put it away. That's not honoring what you truly desire. And that's a big part of the intuitive eating lifestyle, I would say. So I'm, I, I honestly never look at food labels. Like, again, I'm privileged to be able to say that because there's some people who have to, but I just, I just don't. What about noting fiber, protein, or fat content in certain food labels? Yeah. And, and I did mention that I mentioned, you know, fiber, protein, fat. I think maybe, and it's, and, and you actually just kind of called me out a little bit because I think in a lot of ways, the reason I don't look at labels is because I am a dietitian. So I tend to know all of this already. Uh, but generally speaking, you can guess how much protein, if something has protein, fat, or fiber. So maybe at the beginning when you're like getting into uh, a health habit and you want to start just really trying to understand foods that have fiber, protein, and fat, looking at the labels might be helpful, but just at the beginning. And I think, you know, generally speaking, if we have a good knowledge of what has fat, you know, nuts have fat, uh, avocados have fat, seeds and oils. And what has protein? Yogurt, milk, chicken, animal proteins, beans, what has fiber, fruits and vegetables and whole grains. I mean, that's generally speaking what it is. So I still don't find that labels are very helpful in that way either. A lot of the fiber they add to these products are inulin and chicory root anyway, that's not even real fiber. That's a whole nother story. But yes, I, I, I'm just, I called myself out. I am a dietitian, so maybe it's easier for me but I still like to uh, advocate really not a heavy focus on food labels. In fact, I sometimes tell my clients to cover their food labels with paper in their pantry. That might be it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gina. And thank you so much to everyone who joined us today um, and stuck around for the Q&A. Uh, I have a list of resources that I've pulled from the chat and we'll include that uh, in the email that I send to you all, which will also include the replay link to today's recording. Eventually, this will live on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to share that with folks um, if you want to. Also, earlier I had shared the link to Savala Nolan's talk. So if you were inspired by Gina's talk, which was fantastic. And, and Gina, by the way, if you're willing to share your slides, I'd be happy to send those along to folks. Um, otherwise, they'll be viewable in the recording. And, uh, and, and yes, uh, we got some good suggestions in the feedback. Feel free to send us your recommendations for speakers. Uh, well, and I'll make sure you have uh, access to Gina's contact information in the email that I send out so you can connect with her if you'd like to work with her on intuitive eating. I hope you'll join us for the remaining speakers in our series. I'll, I'll include that information in the email as well and have a great day.